Anyway, I'm joking anyway. That's it's third man. It's yeah. third man. Yes. Make sure you bring your own barbecue sauce. <laughs> Hunt's 57 barbecue sauce, matter of fact. And but, not stubs? Yeah, that too, yeah. <laughs> now, I, I noticed your post you had up, and you know what? It is anniversary between the 24th and 25th of February. The Battle of L.A. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because people are listening tonight because, you know, you're posting. I shared it. They want to hear about it. You know, Gary, in your infinite wisdom, I figured that was why you had me on today. So I wanted to make sure and be prepared. Yeah, um, you know, to fully understand the Battle of Los Angeles, which, um, to clarify, we're not talking about the movie, which was okay. But uh, it has nothing to do with the real-life event whatsoever. Um, and I am surprised that many people today aren't familiar with what really happened then. So let me start with, uh, you know, setting the scene. Um, on December 7th, 1941, of course, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese, which wholeheartedly set us off into World War II. Uh, and, you know, America was uh, shaken by the attack, very angry. But uh, other than that, we still hadn't really been attacked on the mainland. Um, we were vigilant, but we still had that sense of not being attacked on our home soil. Until February 23rd of 1942, just a few weeks, eight, nine weeks after Pearl Harbor, around seven in the evening, a uh, Japanese submarine, um, I-17, which was captained by Commando, Commander Nishino, I believe, Kozo Nishino. Uh, it surfaced just off the coast of Santa Barbara near the Elwood oil fields there. And about 15 minutes later, they after targeting the Richfield oil tanks there, they commenced firing using the deck gun. And, of course, totally missed the target, um, which is understandable considering how much you bob in the waves around there, you know, the ocean moving and everything, and then trying to hit a, a target could be very challenging at the time. They didn't have the technology that we do now. Uh, but they did manage to completely destroy a, a pump and an outbuilding and uh, do some damage to the Elwood Pier and a catwalk there. It's estimated that they probably uh, fired between 12 and 25 explosive shells in total, and it, the attack was maybe 20 minutes in duration, and then the sub sailed away. Uh, although they didn't really do that much damage, um, he did achieve his goal, which was to spread fear along the American coastline. And actually, because of this one attack, uh, it's largely responsible for the internment of Japanese-American citizens at the time. So that pretty much set the stage. Of course, you know, that attack in Santa Barbara being so close to Los Angeles uh, got everyone hypervigilant at the time. So on the evening of February 24th, morning of February 25th, Around 2 a.m., when Army radar picked up an object that seemed to be incoming about 120 miles west of Santa Monica, uh, which is out over the, the Pacific Ocean a good ways there, uh, the Klieg lights came on, air, air raid sirens started blowing, and, of course, the blackout procedures went into effect. But then it was around 3.12 in the morning when artillery started firing, and uh, Plague Lights focused on the now world-famous photo uh, from L.A. Times on what appeared to be uh, a saucer-shaped craft by all accounts. So you can look at the picture and judge for yourself, but it certainly does not look like an airplane. It does not look like a balloon. Oh, you're so right. And whatever it was, whatever it was, over 1,400 rounds of artillery fire had absolutely no effect on it. That's not counting the thousands of 50-millimeter rounds that were fired at it. 
And it just floated along like it belonged there and had command of the skies. Until finally around 4.15, the all clear was blown and there was nothing to be seen. Now, some accounts say that it coasted along the mountains, Santa Monica Range, and then out over the ocean. And some accounts say that it was finally shot down and crashed into the ocean and was covered by Navy divers. Uh, however, there is absolutely no proof whatsoever to substantiate that story that I've run across yet. Other accounts are that, you know, it just vanished. Uh, there was a reliable witness, I believe, that uh, he was nine years old at the time. Uh, he's actually in the History Channel uh, segment on the Battle of Los Angeles. But uh, he was a professor of anthropology, and in his statement, he can remember clearly seeing a dish-shaped craft fly directly over his head. So accounts do range from, you know, some people saying that there was absolutely nothing there. Others saying that they think they saw airplanes. Others think they might have seen a balloon. And some swear that they saw flights of aircraft coming. But whatever was that night, still to this day, actually has not been identified. So technically... Um, I would say that this fits all the characteristics of being a true unidentified flying object. Oh, you know, you said it so well. I do want to say a friend of mine, Tom Nelson, who's a retired police officer, his father spotted the submarine. He's actually, when this was going on, he saw the captain on the submarine looking on shore with the binoculars. And his wow. father... He had his binoculars, he was in the military, Army, looked back at the captain, and they looked at each other. That's pretty chilling. <laughs> yeah, Especially is. since, you know, before the war, the captain of that submarine had stopped in there. That's how he knew about um, the refinery there. He'd stopped in there for uh, fuel before when he was a merchant marine, before the war. So, yeah, that's pretty chilling that he they had that encounter with the, with the glasses like that. I can just picture, you know, I know that area well. I can picture what it must have been like around 7 at night and and to see <laughs> someone off the coast like that in the sub. Yeah, that would be pretty chilling. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, what he says, his father was an Army veteran. He spotted the submarine surfacing, and he was watching them from shore with the binoculars. And as the skipper came up, on deck of the submarine with his binoculars, his father was staring at the captain, and the captain was staring back at him. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Could you imagine the thought and then of he each still other? Opened, and, well, then he still opened fire after that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was it between 20? Uh, he must have been slightly worried. He, he would have had to have been slightly worried that there'd be someone on the way after that, you know, knowing that they made eye contact like that. Well, uh, you know, too, you have to understand the, the deck guns are not like automatic guns that they had later in the war. Oh, no. They had to load each no, shell. No, they fired shells. Yeah. And then fire. Yeah, they fired explosive shells. Right. Yeah. So it would take a little time to load each one. You know, they have to, you know, exit the, the casing, put another one in close it and then fire at it again it probably maybe two a minute three a minute so that sub was there for a while but the interest, oh, i doubt even i doubt even that many they'd probably be lucky to get one a minute and and still trying to aim because you got to figure they're doing it right there they were close to shore you know i don't know if you've ever been around santa barbara but the waves there are well known by surfers uh and you'll be bobbing pretty well out there so to try and aim at something uh would take a lot of patience you know in the wrong time of day if it's tide change or whatever you could be just forget it <laughs> oh yeah and you imagine they said they fired between 20 and 40 rounds so that they were at least there a half an hour doing this but they managed the, the well group. no actually the estimates are 12 to 25 and they were only there the the actual firing was only about 20 minutes estimated so that's still and then a they long took time. off completely now it i'm sorry I said that is you still. Broke up. E Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Even 20 minutes is a long time when you think about it. Well, yeah. 
yeah, I mean, it's an eternity when you're under fire. <laughs> yeah, thank God, you know, the accuracy and the waves and the bobbing, you know, otherwise they could have took out the refinery. But don't forget the Japanese also were really good. They were taking these big weather type balloons and putting, you know, incinerary bombs on them and, and heading them, you know, letting them out towards the West Coast. Yeah, there's not really any uh, documentation that that actually happened here. Um, they were doing it in some places, but not in America. Well, they actually um, they were doing those more in islands in the South Pacific. No, they actually and other, they, Iwo Jima places like that. They actually found one in Washington after the war. It didn't ignite, and they found one in I think one or two in Oregon, and that is documented. Huh. So you know, again, they what what they wanted to do was start forest yeah. fires. That's incredible. Yeah, um, pretty lucky those didn't catch. But yeah, as, as far as I was aware, there there weren't any documented cases of them actually uh, using what we we now refer to as Chinese lanterns um, during the war. But I shudder because you know at Mufon we get a lot of reports of the exact same thing. Um, different religious practices and, and people release quantities of them at a time in areas where it's considered, you know, fire hazard or, you know, high fire danger. And uh, people, of course, it, it hasn't been, it hasn't happened in a couple of years. I'll give credit to that because of extreme fire danger. But a few years ago, we were getting a lot of reports of these Chinese lanterns and they were in areas where, you know, if they had come down, it would have burned thousands of acres. So, yeah, that's a very serious object to uh, to consider. Definitely cheap warfare tool. Yeah, how these worked on the weather balloon, they, they, they timed it, or they figured how they time it. It would drift in over the forest and then come down, and when it comes down, it would ignite and, and, and start a fire. And uh, hmm. I, I think it was even documented one fire from it, but I'm not sure. But I tell you... The, you know, when this thing, the Battle of L.A. happened, too, it really shocked the American public because they didn't expect anything like that. They, they you know, we were an no, island. Not at all, yeah. We were an island, far as the people thought. They thought we, you know, nobody would attack the United States. We, And we were isolated. We were pretty much before the war all isolated, our country was. And it shocked people. And could you imagine... They, you know, the report of, you know, the shelling going on at the refinery, the, uh, then again, this object, whatever it was, that it, it, them trying to shoot it down and, and it didn't have no effect. Could you? And that's a lot you of know, rounds to fire off. Absolutely. And uh, the damage the next day, of course, was... Uh, <laughs> due to gravity, because what goes up must come down. And there was an amazing amount of shrapnel damage and artillery damage uh, that was caused. Very lucky, uh, it was a minimal loss of life, and I think anyone that did, uh, did pass away from the event, I think it was there was two heart attacks, I believe, um, that were caused during the event. But fortunately, um, no one was hit. Although there was one woman who was sleeping in bed when shrapnel came through her roof and hit her pillow. I mean, you know, it, it could have <laughs> gone very badly had it been a few inches off because they showed the photo, the hole in her roof, and then she pointed to where it hit on her bed. And, uh, yeah, it could have ended a lot differently there. Oh, yeah. that's So what, very oh. lucky that uh, so so little loss of life occurred during the event. But my dad was so shaken up by it. He, he and my mom lived uh, kind of east of L.A. at the time in a, a town called Monterey Park. That, uh, you know, all this stuff from downtown L.A. was still visible back then. And uh, he, of course, was in, in uh, the Navy at the time. Um, I think I believe he was home on leave when this happened oh, hey, or Jeff. just getting ready to ship out. Hey, Jeff, we need to take a break. I was so yes. engrossed in our conversation. I forgot about the break for the radio stations. I'll be back in like two minutes. You're listening to Night Dreams Talk Radio. Our Jeff, uh, Jeff Cross tonight talking about the Battle of L.A. We're going to be talking about Move On and 
UFOs. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. 